Okay, folks, we'll go ahead and get started um, this evening. I'm <clears throat> just going to make mention we've got Lucy and Ron with us tonight, so they're going to kind of be watching the chat box. So any questions you've got, just pop them in there. But as always, uh, we'll get those turned around and sent out to you tonight or tomorrow in a uh, Word document, so you'll have access to that via email, and it'll also be put in the Google Drive. So welcome tonight. Uh, we're shifting gears a little bit. We're kind of taking it away from some of the Appalachian focus that we've been doing in the last, I guess, four classes. Um, and we're kind of going to keep with that theme a little bit because we're still going to be looking at plants, but more specifically, we're going to get into some of the phytochemical properties of some of those plants that we have referred to in the last four weeks. So. Um, I'm going to try to keep it pretty simple. Uh, I don't want to go over everybody's heads on some of this stuff, including my own, when it comes to some of those phytochemical uh, properties. But I do want you to have a, an understanding of, of some of the special gifts that plants do, in fact, give us that maybe we've not um, always thought about um, before. Uh, so again, just before we get started, uh, keep those questions and comments in the chat box. I won't be able to see those, but uh, and Jenny's not with us tonight but we will make sure we get those answered and just stay tuned i think we've got four more weeks after tonight so um, hang in there with us and remember that an evaluation will be coming toward the end of november first of december and that really does help guide us into 2021's programming efforts so just ask when you get that make sure you complete that and get it back to us Okay, so without further ado, we'll jump in here. And I know several of you have probably seen a, um, a few of these slides that I'm gonna show to begin with, but it's just gonna kind of serve as a refresher, uh, especially when we go to talking about herbs, because from a university um, perspective, we wanna be able to you know, provide the foundation that kind of helps put some of that horticultural history in context. And we know that all of these elements have always been entwined. And if nothing else, we've really seen that in the last uh, four classes. Uh, but if you're a master gardener, just remember, um, we, we're, we don't teach about the medical uh, components of plants and, and comment on some of those modern medicinal uses, but you're going to hear me reference several of those um, tonight, again, just from that historical context. And there's that disclaimer. So um, just to kind of get us started again, many of you know what an herb is, but again, to set the stage, we just want to remember that an herb is going to be any plant that's going to be used for its medicinal properties, its flavor, or scent, or any combination of those. Uh, sometimes we're going to use those for both culinary and medicinal uh, purposes, sometimes even spiritual ones, uh, what you saw last week. I do remember as we move through tonight that herbs are going to differ a little bit from spices because those herbs are going to be narrowly defined as the leafy green part of the plant, whereas the seeds and berries, bark, root, and fruit are going to be classified as uh, spices. And just also kind of tuck it in the back of your mind that an herb is actually more of a cultural term. It's not really a botanical term, even though years ago we referred to um, herbalist as botanist. That's kind of where that terminology came from. But again, it's a cultural term. It's just going to depend on the situation uh, for what that plant specifically is being used for. And there are going to be some cultures uh, around the globe that are going to utilize herbs a little bit more in a broader context than what we do here. Uh, you also heard me mention a couple of times in some of our previous classes, um, some of the warts or warts, W-O-R-T. Um, that is our Old English, just old diction for herb is what that means. Uh, just to take it way back, 60,000 years is the big number there because that's how long we've actually been accumulating and utilizing herbal knowledge. Um, that's quite a remarkable number there. We've got uh, written proof. Uh, you know, 5,000 years ago, the Sumerians, which is in, in Mesopotamia, which is modern day Iraq, were utilizing herbs. Uh, we've got proof from a Neanderthal burial that took place in Shandahar in northern Iraq. Um, it shows that that individual was uh, laid in, in the soil and covered with grape hyacinth, uh, yarrow, ephedra, henbane, and a few other plants that I can't remember off the top of my head, but that is in the, in the notes. Um, a lot of those herbs that you heard me mention, of course, they're still used in practicality today, be it medicinal or even some medicinal um, culinary uses. We've also discovered um, tooth plaque on Neanderthals that suggests that they, they chewed on yarrow and chamomile and, and poplar. 
Uh, when we delve just a little bit deeper, um, when we talk about an herbal, you know, oftentimes we'll hear that in front of tea, you know, an herbal tea or a, you know, sometimes an herbal uh, spa, but an herbal uh, is actually an ancient manual and it helps facilitate the identification of plants for specific medicinal uh, uses. And like I said in that beginning slide, we're going to use them for a multitude of things. And many of these plants you've probably already picked up on are going to be used, they're multifaceted. They can be used in multiple ways. And you can see there that hundreds of medicinal plants were known in India before the Christian era. And um, the Chinese have a comp compilation of about 1900 ancient herbal uh, remedies. And the Greeks also have um, written accounts. Of course, we know that, that China and India have a lot of um, emphasis that's placed on the medicinal use of, of herbs. Uh, they specifically incorporate these practices or the plants with uh, acupuncture practices, uh, utilizing massage therapy and of course diet and exercise. And of course India was the birthplace of the science of life or what we refer to as Ayurveda medicine. So many of you are probably familiar with that terminology. Uh, but the Egyptians also contributed to the history of herbs. Uh, they utilized magic, um, prayers, spells, sacrifices, and even embalming. So that's where we actually owe that practice to, because this is where fragrant spices were used upon death to cleanse the inside of the cor those corpses to appease the gods of death. And it was this one practice, too, of embalming that helps uh, stimulate world trade all those years ago. Um, herbs have always greatly influenced cultures uh, around the globe. You can still see remnants of that today. A lot of uh, the uses that we see here in the U.S. Have, have come from some of those ancient cultures. And I'm not going to go into a great detail here, but you do have these to uh, refer to later. Um, I always talk about um, the Odyssey, the Iliad and the Odyssey. Homer, um, ancient poet that, that often referred to herbs. Um, even Queen Elizabeth I, you know, that was the great age of herbals, uh, the Hanging uh, Gardens of Babylon, of course, the Benedictine uh, monasteries, I don't, I don't think I have that in, in this presentation, but some of that liqueur, Benedictine liqueur actually come from there. The Hippocratic Oath that our doctors take to practice medicine, uh, that was born out of some of the influential use of herbs as well. Uh, you can see a lot of this today um, in the New World that kind of gave rise from the Roman Garden Villas. So a lot of those that you see there listed on the left, uh, the geometrically precise, think of some of these maybe botanical gardens or Biltmore House comes to mind. Um, some of those geometrically precise gardens that, uh, using uh, topiaries, canals and fountains, even raised beds and potted plants. And you can kind of see where a lot of our principles came from that. Raised beds, again, companion planting, and then again, that marriage of traditions that we talked about last week with Native Americans. So that kind of sets the scene, just a, a little bit of a refresher. Like I said, I know some of you have already seen some of those slides, but we're going to kind of, we're at a crossroads again, and we're going to kind of take a different turn to, to what we've been doing. And, and really look at what some of these plants give us. And phytochemistry of plants is just the study of chemicals in plants. And we've probably all heard some of these terms at one point or, point or the other. Uh, they do, in fact, give us so many good things, maybe bad things, or maybe a combination of the two. So um, I wasn't sure exactly how to start with these, which one to start with and all that. So I attempted to go in alphabetical order, but I think I kind of got out of sync a little bit. Um, throughout the middle of the presentation. But I'm gonna kick us off with alkaloids because this is probably where some of our most popular plants are at. Uh, but we often hear that term alkaloids. Um, the first alkaloid was actually morphine. It was isolated in 1804 from the opium poppy. If you've heard of atropine or scopolamine, uh, that comes from the belladonna plant, which is a member of the nightshade family. Um, I say that just to say that, you know, nightshade, think about your uh, crop families again, tomatoes, eggplants, potatoes, peppers, all of those are also in that nightshade family. Uh, but atramine is often found in prescription medication for diarrhea, lamotil, some of you may be um, uh, familiar with that. Um, it's also been used as an antidote for or, um, organophosphorus or carbamate or even the hallucinogenic mushrooms. It's been used as an antidote for those poisonings. It helps uh, treat slow heart rate or bradycardia. Uh, scopolamine is used uh, for motion sickness. 
So it's going to be, again, one of those uh, by prescription only, but it's going to act similar to what Dramamine does. So the plant that you see here, Belladonna, it actually produces uh, scopolamine and, and it has been used for centuries. It was not always used in a good way. It has, um, it has a storied past and there are some links in the notes um, if you want to read up on, on that further. But it does um, help block the signals of imbalance that cause uh, motion sickness. Uh, another alkaloid is strychnine. It comes from the strychnos nux uh, vomica is the Latin for that. Um, actually today it's used more in pesticides. So think about um, like a rat poison. But again, years ago it was used um, actually to, to treat humans, but they discovered that maybe they weren't treating humans as much as they were maybe killing off humans. So, you know, been in the, been in the history books for a long time. Um, I can never talk about uh, any, any plant without uh, bringing tobacco into the mix because those of you that know me know that I grew up with this crop and worked in this crop for years before coming back to extension. But um, tobacco is known to have alkaloids, um, nicotine being the most prominent, uh, but there are actually secondary alkaloids that can actually be a little bit more um, dangerous, if you will, uh, to the consumption of tobacco even more so than the nicotine. A lot of different factors can affect some of these alkaloids, just depending on how those plants are grown. Uh, nitrogen fertility, we often will talk about uh, if we push too much nitrogen to, to tomato plants, for instance, they won't flower, they won't set fruit. Um, if we push too much um, nitrogen fertility to a tobacco plant, then that increases nitrosamines in the plant, which is a carcinogen, uh, which is a, a, pretty, a pretty bad compound uh, to be inhaling. Uh, this is the quinine plant. We're hearing a lot about that in the news lately, uh, but this, this actually comes from the chinchona tree pictured here in Peru, and it's still used as a treatment for malaria today. Um, it actually comes from the bark of that tree, and of course, again, it is native to South America. It's a little bit tad different from some of the other alkaloids we just talked about because this one is going to be used in AFib um, or cardiac arrhythmia medications as well. But you can see there it does, you can actually see it says on the label of the Canada Dry that it does in fact contain quinine. Uh, you heard me mention this a couple of weeks ago uh, when I said uh, we were going to talk about some of these humble plants. This is Vinca Minor or uh, Periwinkle. Some folks will consider this a ground cover, some folks will consider this a weed, but irregardless of what circumstance it is, uh, one of the, the big things on the horizon is that it's currently being used um, in, in cancer treatment. Uh, it's a chemo, chemotherapy drug. And actually 86 um, alkaloids have been derived from this one plant alone, which is pretty cool. But if you've ever heard of vinblastine, uh, that actually comes from the periwinkle. Um, a lot of those drugs that have V-I-N in the prefix um, may actually come from the from the vinca or the periwinkle that you see here. Um, alkaloids again have kind of a storied past um, where a lot of common plants are going to fall into this category but you see here pictured on the left these are actually two different plants. The one here on the left is is one that we're probably all you utilize to jumpstart our day, this is caffeine. Um, caffeine is actually going to be found in the seeds, nuts, or the leaves of a number of plants. It's not just coffee that you're going to find in um, East Asia, Africa, any of those tropical areas. Um, but anyway, it is going to be coffee. We've got about 120 species of coffee plants worldwide, excluding the Katura type um, varieties. But think about Yerba Mate, uh, tea and chocolate, all of those are going to contain um, caffeine. Uh, the one you see pictured there on the right, and you can see some similar properties, but that is the coca plant, C-O-C-A, not cocoa, C-O-C-O-A, but coca is actually cocaine. And I have a really hard time pronouncing that Latin, arethaloxacae, I think, something similar to that. Uh, but anyway, that one is, of course, used as a stimulant, much like our caffeine. Um, another one of our phytochemical properties, moving off of alkaloids, is our bitter compounds. And these, pretty self-explanatory, 
they have that bitter taste. They're going to yield that bitter taste after the fact. Um, but they're known to be able to stimulate the appetite and thus aid in digestion. So a bitter herb is going to be one that is going to uh, possess any kind of bitter taste. And often these bitters are going to be used for ceremonies, um, healing, and cooking. They can range from mild to strong. It just depends on the plant. And often sometimes frost or freeze is going to enhance or, or take away from those bitter compounds. Uh, a light uh, bitter would be chamomile. A lot of folks don't realize chamom chamomile is in fact a bitter. Or uh, rue is actually going to be a really um, strong bitter. But again, they can improve the digestion and help counter inflammation. Uh, the really cool thing about um, the tongue, we've talked a little bit um, about the taste receptors in, in the past, um, but bitter receptor is going to be located at the back of your throat. So um, if you're a wine drinker or eat any of these bitter foods, you're often going to taste that in the back of your throat, and it's going to be one of the last things you. Hush. All right, everybody, check your microphone. Um, make sure that you're muted. We've got an unhappy camper somewhere, y'all. Okay, there we go. All right, but anyway, um, there is such a thing as a super taster, and that just means that you can actually taste bitters a little bit better than some, and you can kind of see here on the tongue how those are um, situated. There's actually about 5,000 taste receptors on the tongue alone, and they're basically just there to kind of analyze the food that enters your mouth, and that helps stimulate your body as to how it's going to treat that food uh, further throughout the digestion process. So bitters are going to deliver the strongest response. So even coffee in the morning, um, that's another thing to just to make mention, even though coffee is an alkaloid, it is also going to fall in the bitter category as well. So they can, uh, plants can fall into multiple categories. So oftentimes folks will start their day with a cup of coffee, a bitter, it helps aid in digestion. All right. There we go. Uh, so this is Artemisia. It's one of the wormwood species. Um, absinthe actually comes from this plant. It's very potent. It's a very potent source of bitterness. Um, we no longer really have that liquor um, available, but it was considered the magical green drink uh, years ago, and it, it does have a lot of folklore and history associated uh, with that. It was known to be powerfully intoxicating and very, very bitter tasting. It is um, the main herb used in absinthe, um, and it has a substance called thujone. It's what makes it so um, bitter. Incredibly toxic, though. Uh, many of you probably recognize this as hops. Um, they are known for giving beer its signature bitter flavor. Um, otherwise, how boring would beer be, y'all? Um, this is the only other species of plant that's found in the cannabis family. So this does belong in with hemp and marijuana, it is part of that family. Uh, it does um, produce a pretty powerful medicinal resin on the female flower buds that you can see pictured there. And again, that resin is where that primary bitter flavor is gonna, is gonna come from. And basically, again, what those bitters are doing is kind of stimulating that vagus nerve to do, to do its thing. Uh, the female plant is the one that's gonna grow the flowers. Uh, the male plants are going to be pollinators and the vines are going to come in male or female. You can kind of see those pictured behind there, but it's only the female that's going to produce these cones that we actually use uh, for the hops. Uh, for the Passover cedar ceremony, uh, bitter herbs always were utilized to symbolize the embittered slavery experienced by the Jews in ancient Egypt. Um, the reason they utilize these herbs was again to just tell that story and to keep that story alive just so that history was never forgotten. And so this is still taught every year at Passover. Uh, the bitter herbs that they commonly use today, you can see those pictured here, are horseradish and romaine lettuce. But also in the Bible, uh, you, you will hear mention of chicory and coriander, even dandelion is in there, mint, sorrel, and wormwood. And I already made mention to coffee probably being one of our most favorite bitters. But if you like to eat artichokes, those are right up there at the top as well. 
Um, essential oils. This is probably a, one of our, well, it's one of my favorites. Uh, a lot of uh, folks are starting to utilize these more and more. They're just those concentrated aromatic essences of plants. And you see there, they can provide an antiseptic protection for the growing plant. So it's not just you reaping the benefit, it's actually like a defense mechanism that's built into these plants that we're just using. Um, some of these oils are actually going to be what give that herb a specific flavor and is what is going to contribute to that health profile. And then of course fragrance. So you'll see there there's more than 400 essences that have been identified but only about 50 of those are going to be available to the public. Primarily uh, these are going to be delivered via massage so anytime you go to the spa you're going to see different mixes of these essential oils to be able to be used. You can probably tell I'm suffering a little bit from some sinus congestion so eucalyptus has really been uh, uh, waking, waking my sinuses up here in the last few days. Um, also aromatherapy uh, again in those massage settings and you can see there just a, a few of those that you could utilize um, in diffusers or the reeds or just in massage therapy. Uh, lemon balm here, uh, you're going to utilize that in a variety of ways. Again, it's to, to just make mention that plants are not used for one spe specific purpose. So lemon balm, we use that in a tea, we use that to attract honeybees as a pollinator. And then the oil of this actually helps induce sleep. A lot of people think citrus and the honey helps wake you up, but this one will actually help uh, with sleep issues. If you go back even into the Bible or years ago, frankincense and myrrh were two of those essential oils that the Egyptian, uh, that, were, that were mentioned and then the Egyptians utilized in um, mummification as well. So you can see the tree that uh, frankincense actually comes from here is the Bos Boswellia tree and then myrrh it comes from the Comifora plant. Pretty cool, unique little plant. This one here has more defense mechanisms than I want to deal with. <laughs> uh, this is the neem tree. Um, it is a biopesticide. Many of you probably utilize neem in your gardens. It's actually a member of the mahogany family. So we're again not only using these for culinary or medicinal, but they can be used um, as pesticides. Many alternative uses there. Some of you may recognize this plant as the tuberose, Polyanthus tuberosa. Um, it is the most expensive um, essential oil on the market because it takes about 60,000 of these to make an ounce of rose oil. And that's the reason it is so costly. Uh, this one here is the Lang Lang tree, Cananaga odorata. That's a mouthful. Um, but this um, tree has very fragrant flowers. Some of you have probably heard me say this before, but uh, when I did a talk actually about a year ago in West Palm Beach, um, she gave me some Lang Lang flowers and I, I put them in my backpack and you can still smell the Lang Lang in there a year later. Even I mean, those petals, I removed them, you know, when I came home, but it's a very, very fragrant. It smells like spicy jasmine. Um, but they will actually uh, distill this by steam and utilize Lang Lang in a lot of perfumes, um, skin lotions, hair oil, and Lang Lang actually means flowers uh, of flowers. And I don't have it written up here, but Lang Lang is actually Y-L-A-N-G. And again, remember, there's a lot of notes in here, so you'll be able to, to see these better later. Um, if you like Chanel number no. five, Lang Lang is the essential oil utilized in that perfume. So just a little FYI. Uh, ladies, another one of our phytochemical properties are enzymes. This one kind of goes hand in hand with essential oils. Um, they're going to be found in all plants. They're serving as those organic catalysts. They're going to be necessary for any kind of chemical function um, inside the plant. And then, you know, think about facials uh, for us. And um, we were just talking about getting facials today here in the office and how much younger they can make your your skin look. Uh, but enzymes are basically going to speed up chemical reactions uh, anywhere in the human body. It's not just on your face, it's inside and out. Um, it's often been said um, by scientists that without enzymes there would basically be no life. So they're basically the little worker bees that make things happen. 
lots of different enzymes. So when I, when I say internally, think about those digestive enzymes. Some people will take those before eating a meal. Uh, you've probably heard of metabolic enzymes. And then of course, just food and plant enzymes too. So there's gonna be some, some links in there that you can refer to, but some of the most common that we are gonna utilize would be the pineapple, aloe, um, ginger, and um, what is that passion fruit? Is that passion fruit? I think, yeah. Um, there are four, I don't wanna go into a lot of these cause then we start really getting in deep and breaking it down. But uh, if you're interested in, in how those enzymes work, you can kinda see these. And again, the links are in the notes so you could read up on those a little bit better. Another phytochemical property are gums. Uh, this is one of my favorite one because you just don't really think about gums being a, a property of plants but as they are defined they're sticky substances and they're going to be insoluble in any kind of organic uh, solvent so these are basically going to be formed again as that plant's defense mechanism and they're produced as a result of any kind of of wound um, natural gums that are occurring in these plants are going to be polysaccharides um, of, of natural origin they're just going to increase um, the plant's viscosity even at really small concentrations. So they're gonna be found more so in the woody elements or plants and seed coatings. Let me see if I've got a picture. Yeah, so think about plantain. You've heard me talk about that one here. Um, probably every class I mentioned plantain and what a powerhouse it is. Whoops. We also get psyllium seed um, from that plant, from Plantago. And they're used commercially for, for mucilage uh, to kind of help make you feel full, used as a dietary uh, fiber, helps lower cholesterol and uh, blood sugar. This plant over here, we don't grow that here in the US, but this is also um, an emulsifier, it's a thickener, uh, but this is actually an orchid, it's the cognac plants uh, corm, um, and it's actually utilized too as glucomannan fiber. So that's the primary source for that, either one of those. You can see there that's a wound on that tree and you can see that gumminess that occurs. And in um, horticulture, we refer to that as gummosis or just gumming syndrome. And again, that's just a response uh, to an injury. Just remember as we move through the next few slides that gums are gonna be a little bit different from resins. So make sure you know to kind of check out that link in there. It'll, it'll describe that a little bit better. Uh, this one here is actually a, a seaweed. It's red and got a very bright, vibrant color. It's, a, it's an edible seaweed, uh, carrageenan, and it's used to, uh, as a binding agent to help things stick together and as a thickening uh, product. And you can see a lot of those products listed there. It has absolutely no nutritional value but yet it still gives us a great benefit. So I'm kind of, for one, glad that it's in my ice cream and Cool Whip. So um, this carrageenan though, if you read food labels and you know those food labels, this is considered a food additive. So this is the E407 on that list. Um, tragant, tra I can't say that word. Tragacanth is also a natural gum and it comes from astragalus. And you can probably tell by looking at that, that that is a legume. Um, often we will refer to that as milk vetch. Uh, this is one in Chinese medicine that they use um, pretty frequently. But if you've ever heard of gum Arabic or carob gum, um, those are also gonna be a gum. They come from the acacia tree, uh, the carob locust bean, that would be another one that's gonna be used as a gum. Um, and again, when you see that kind of response on a plant or the tree, that is just a defense um, mechanism. You can also take the dried sap that contains that gum and extract it and use that as a, as, as a food additive too. I don't know if you can see these, that's very legible, but uh, that would be the E4, uh, 413, blah, 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 413. And you can see kind of where these fall in here as emulsifiers and stabilizers. So um, again, a lot of folks don't realize just all the things that plants do and in, in fact give us. If it is on this E list though, just remember that that is considered an additive. Um, this is also gonna be utilized um, to seal that flag on a cigar. 
wrapper. And if you're an artist, it's often going to be used in those pastel paints as well. Um, if you've um, ever heard of xanthan gum, sometimes you'll see that on the label and actually see a couple of those listed here. But xanthan gum comes from bacteria during fermentation, during that fermentation product, uh, process. So if anybody's on a keto diet or a low carb, uh, you're probably having to use xanthan gum uh, for some of your um, cooking and food processing because it does add bulk with absolutely no carbs. So um, the cool thing about this xanthan gum is that it is the same thing that causes black rot on broccoli or cauliflower or any of those brassica, brassica plants. Um, it's xanthomonasis uh, compestris, so it's kind of cool. You can see what that looks like. That's something we don't want to be um, dealing with in our um, brassicas, but in fact, it's no carb and used in keto diet, so pretty cool. Um, again, it, um, guar gum is going to be considered a legume. I thought that was going to flip and show the pictures, but I don't have it set there. But you can kind of see how these, uh, this plant looks here in the wild. Anytime we've got those seed pods on there, it's going to be a legume. And often legume is going to serve as a source for some of these natural uh, gums. The guar gum is also going to be utilized in cattle feeds or in cover crops, uh, fracking, and even paper and textiles. Uh, glycosides, and this is one of the bigger families, bigger phytochemical families, but these are just substances that are being broke down by specific enzymes and they yield a sugar and then thus a therapeutic treatment. So you probably recognize a few plants here, the, the foxglove, elderberries, and lima beans. So we're going to talk about the elderberries and lima beans in a few minutes, but um, the foxglove here is actually digitalis, which is a cardiac glycoside. This is probably one of the most popular glycosides. This is salix alba or salicylic acid, uh, which gave us aspirin years ago. Uh, the funny thing though, Metasweet um, also possesses salicylic acid. That's a hard one to, to say. Um, and actually the form from Metasweet causes less digestive upset than actually the willow tree, just as an FYI. Senna, which is pictured here at the top, and rhubarb here at the bottom, and then aloe. Um, also, also, I don't have it pictured here, but they have laxative properties. Uh, they're anthraquinine, which is considered a um, glycoside. So some of these over-the-counter, like Miralax, uh, this one has propylene glycol, but uh, some of those over-the-counter are actually going to be um, a, a natural substitute for some of these medications like this. Rhubarb and Senna natural, a little bit easier on the digestive system. Uh, flavonoids are glycosides, but they're a subgroup of glycosides. Um, flavonoids are where anthocyanins are going to fall, so you've probably heard that verbiage being touted around, especially in the last couple of years. But anthocyanins are a flavonoid, which is a glycoside, basically is how that falls out. But uh, when we look at flavonoids, there's about 5,000 of those that occur naturally from various plants. You can see strawberries here. So um, when you go out to pick strawberries next st uh, spring, just say, oh, so I'm picking uh, glycosides. Uh, they do contain uh, pelargonidin, also is found in red geraniums that, that we use in the landscape setting. So same glycoside that's going to be responsible for those coloring. Um, parsley, this is going to be one of those powerhouses. You've heard me mention it um, a couple of times. Um, this one is chock full of flavonoids. So a lot of health benefits um, to the parsley plant. Polyphenols, these are a subgroup of flavonoids as well. And you can kind of see that bluish, reddish color there. Um, these are antioxidants. This is where the, we're going to umbrella kind of house these. So you see the blueberries pictured there, uh, grapes. Again, anything that's red and blue, and you're probably maybe wondering why I do, why you have peanuts there. But think about the shell casing on the inside of a um, peanut. It's actually red skinned. Um, I like to say that I'm drinking my polyphenols. You can kind of see here how this all falls out. So many of our favorite beverages are um, pictured on this slide from black tea to red wine to our beer. 
um, even apple juice. It's not too bad, y'all, but uh, you can kind of see what that polyphenol polyphenolic antioxidant compounds uh, rate in regards to drinking. So you can drink one glass of red wine, two cups of tea, and, um, and get your daily quota for polyphenols. You're going to be drinking a lot of beer, though. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on flavonoids, but again, a huge uh, component of antioxidants. They do so much. Um, they are going to be what contributes to attracting pollinators. They are going to kind of control uh, flower color, like we were talking about with strawberries and geraniums. They're even going to control some of that flavor. Uh, seed germination and seed maturation. You see here stress management. So a lot of good things are coming from flavonoids on the plant side before it even gets uh, to us. Now here's a few to make mention of. Um, I think I've probably mentioned these in the last several weeks, at least some of these, or you've, you've heard some of us kind of talking about um, cyanide in some of these plants. So apricots, uh, bamboo shoots, cassava, corn, wild cherries. Um, we saw the picture of the elderberries there a few minutes ago and lima beans. All of these are sources of cyanide, which kind of makes them cool. And some other plants are, I think, bitter almond, um, eucalyptus. I was just talking about that one. Um, did I mention black seed? I don't remember if I did. But anyway, there's many plants, even bacteria and fungi, can actually produce uh, cyanotic uh, compounds. Um, it is going to be found naturally. There's about 2,600 plants that are actually going to contain some form of cyanide, uh, but we call again those cyanogenic uh, glu uh, glycosides. Um, they do have a structure, which means they have one sugar, or they're linked to a sugar, hence the name glyco. So um, that's actually what helps give it, uh, I guess maybe you would term that maybe it's safer quality. But think about uh, some of these, like the cassava. Um, a lot of cyanide poisonings have happened in some of the poor countries around the world because they use that as a main food source and can't always cook that um, the way it needs to be cooked in order to cook out some of those cyanotic um, compounds. Uh, lima beans years ago, before, um, before we grow what we grow now or what we purchase in the grocery store, uh, if you ever get a hold of like an old cookbook, it'll tell you in there to, to boil it uh, in an open pot uh, for hours, drain that off, boil it again. Um, that's referring to the, um, the cyanide in the in the beans. You don't have to do that now because that's a that's something that's been bred out of some of the newer hybrids. But years ago that was why you would see that always having to cook on uh, because boiling would help make the beans sweeter as it cooked that glyco. Remember that's always attached to the cyanide cyanide uh, cyanide compounds. I can't talk tonight y'all. Uh, but just kind of cool. There's several links in there to kind of refer you back to some of these really cool plants with some of those compounds. Uh, saponins are another phytochemical compound in plants. Uh, you can see there they're going to be kind of irritating, similar to soap. Uh, many are going to be related to steroids. Uh, several of these are going to yield sex hormones, so think about estrogen and cortisol. Um, here's a plant that we've talked about numerous times, uh, ginseng. Uh, but basically these saponins, Again, they're, they're going to be found in most of our plants. Anything that has soap in the name, soap berry, soap wort, any of those, um, they're going to possess a saponin. Some of those plants are actually going to be used like a soap substitute. They're going to form a sudsy uh, a lather when you combine them with water. Uh, more than likely, they're going to be found in the, the skins, in the plant skins. They're going to um, provide that waxy coating. So, you know, when we tell you to go out and spray your hollies or your rhododendrons um, with a, I don't know if you're treating it with a fungicide or something, we always say to add a little bit of dish detergent to that because it helps it stick and spread out on that leaf. Well, that waxy coating is where these saponins are coming from. Again, that's going to be a defense mechanism uh, for that plant. Uh, but ginseng is going to be one of the most popular saponins, uh, wild yam, alfalfa, sarsaparilla, um, Lily of the Valley, all of those are going to have these uh, saponins, um, horse chestnut, um, but they're going to have these, these properties. In women, um, ginseng is known to um, provide an estrogen, estrogen effect, and in, in men it can help enhance 
fertility. Uh, this one here is the soapwort. It's a pretty little flower um, as well. It's a multi-purpose herb. So even if you're not using it for anything else, it's just, it's just pretty. But um, you can utilize the roots to create bubbles. It forms a really nice lather. So you're going to find uh, several products on the market. They're going to have some of these natural saponins that they're utilizing. Uh, Romans would actually use soapwort as a water softener. Uh, farmers would use this plant to, to bathe sheep before they sheared the sheep, and it would help uh, clean the wool as well. And then uh, colonists, again, they brought this plant with them, so you're liable to see this along um, old home sites because they did, in fact, use this as a soap substitute. Um, it can be boiled and utilized to um, create a cleanser that can... Um, even clean textiles. So some, you know, think about like a not fabric softener. What am I trying to think of? Like shout, um, spot cleaner on your laundry or even uh, carpet cleaners um, are going to contain plant forms with uh, saponins. Another really cool saponin that we talked about a couple weeks ago was the yucca plant. Uh, Kills is pretty popular on the market, and you're going to see um, calendula serum infused water cream. Again, that's a saponin base. Uh, we use calendula in a lot of medicinal salves. Uh, blue cohosh is one that we've spent a lot of time talking about in the last um, few weeks. You can also get that in a, in a dietary supplement form, in a pill form. Uh, but both of these, especially the blue cohosh, was utilized by the Native Americans. So um, it was also, uh, the reason the blue cohosh was used because it was said by the Indians to help improve muscle tone in the uterus. So it was going to be one of those used in childbirth. Uh, my favorite phytochemical property is tannins. Um, as a as a wine drinker, um, if, if you're drinking a red wine, um, anytime you feel like you're having to chew that wine, uh, those astringent compounds um, are what is kind of leaving that essence um, in, your, in your mouth. Um, sometimes you'll re re hear this referred to as tannic um, acid, but they're wa water-soluble polyphenols, and they're going to be present in a lot of different foods that you see pictured here from uh, cocoa to, to tea, wine, coffee, uh, chocolate, and even cinnamon. Uh, raspberry and yarrow are going to be two plants that, are, that have um, high amounts of tannic acid as well. So anything that kind of makes your tongue fizzy, makes you feel like you're having to chew it, uh, is going to typically have some of those um, tannin properties. Uh, a lot of these plants um, that have high amounts of tannins are going to be used to tighten up like varicose veins. Uh, they've been known to uh, dry up any kind of watery secretions, uh, watery eyes, or, or again diarrhea. Um, it helps stop heavy bleeding and can clot blood a little bit faster. Uh, but we got a lot of plants that are going to fall into this list. Um, artichoke, uh, borage, uh, sweet flag, comfrey, um, ephedra, Witch hazel would also fall in there, willow um, again, vervain, and even some of our thymes and uh, dock would also have high amounts of tannic acid. Uh, we talked about this one last week, I think, uh, the English oak, which was once considered a, a pagan symbol, uh, but the acorns have been used uh, for, as a coffee substitute. And then acorns were also fed uh, to pigs. And you see there, um, this is a oak, barrel. So a lot of our red wines are going to be aged in English oak uh, just because of the grain. Um, French and Slavonian oak are both going to be English oak um, and that's traditionally what we are going to see utilized in wine making. Uh, Slavonian oak, which is not from Slo Slovenia, the country, it's actually an area in Croatia, but there's a huge amount of uh, Slavonian forest there, and it yields a little bit of a, a lighter taste to wine. They'll actually use it to age white wine in, again, because of that tighter grain. Uh, French oak's got a little bit of a looser grain. Um, it's going to be utilized primarily in reds because it's going to impart that more tannic acid, and again, that's anytime you feel like you're kind of chewing on, on those drinks. Uh, this this plant here is known as the king of herbs in France. You probably recognize it as tar tarragon. It's going to be one that has enormous amounts of tannins. 
Um, it is going to be an essential addition to Bernay sauce. Um, it's going to be utilized in the Fennis herb blend. It's going to have that really pungent um, bittersweet flavor like licorice, uh, fennel. Um, it is going to be a naturally occurring uh, compound in that. A lot of folks will also use this in chicken salad just to give it a little bit different flavor. Uh, but it is known uh, for its French or French cuisine is known uh, for tarragon. In Hungary they utilize it in soup. Um, in Persian uh, cuisine they use it in vegetables. So lots of different cultures around the world uh, utilize tarragon. Uh, then we have the phytochemical property of mucilage and this is a viscous gum that's going to swell into a gel in water. And we're going to utilize that to soothe irritated or inflamed skin. So you see that picture here, this is going to be uh, the marshmallow, which is two words, not one. Uh, but they derive their properties again from the polysaccharides that they contain. And basically when they have these polysaccharides, they've got like a slippery, uh, mild taste, they swell in water, and they're going to produce like a gel-like mass. And that's why they're um, touted for um, irritated or inflamed skin. And again, you see this is uh, Malva parviflora. Uh, they've got ring-shaped fruit. Um, they're actually called cheeses, and they're often used in um, cosmetics and a lot of makeup. Uh, the root contain actual natural sugars, again those polysaccharides, and they were used in early sweets. So um, this is where the confection marshmallow come from. Um, Lucy's on here, she actually did her intern presentation a couple months ago on, on the plant, the marshmallow. So very interesting uh, little, little plant. Um, one of my favorite desserts was uh, one I had in South Africa, a Malva pudding. Um, that's actually like a caramelized cake, spongy texture. Um, some um, places served it with an apricot jam and then they would pour a cream sauce over it while it was hot, but they actually called it Malva pudding. And of course we have vitamins and minerals. We would be remiss if we didn't uh, mention these phytochemical properties, uh, the most boring subset of our phytochemistry for tonight, but we all know we need our vitamins and minerals and way too broad of a subject, like much of what we're going over tonight, because again, we're just scratching the surface, trying to introduce some new terminology to you, but uh, vitamin, vitamins and minerals are going to be required for all kinds of met metabolic functions, uh, but you'll notice there, they're not going to serve as a catalyst. They're going to kind of be a standalone. So a couple that I uh, I picked out to to share, and I spent a little I spent a little bit of time on this trying to figure out. But um, I decided on nettles because if you like kale and you consume it for um, I guess the mineral content we talked about that last week, it's got a high high amounts of iron and calcium. Um, and then of course if you cook these, then it'll take the prickle out, boil the boil the prickle out, but um, it's a huge source of calcium, even more so than kale. So if you like kale, you might want to try nettles. Um, also a good um, supplier of vitamin D as well, which I've got this one pictured over here, and this one is actually alfalfa. Um, a lot of people will use this as a, as a grazing livestock food as well, but it also um, just for people is a has a high amount of vitamin D. And we're hearing a lot about vitamin D again because if you have, if you take a supplement, then it can help ward off COVID. I've heard that in the news in the last few weeks. So just throwing that in there. Um, so we kind of went over some of those phytochemical properties. And I, I didn't want to again bind you down with a lot of that because it is a lot of information. But I wanted to kind of look into some other plant properties and kind of maybe give you some food for thought, if you will. Uh, but here's another one we've spent some time talking about. This is the balsam fir, also known as the she balsam because of these little knots that you see that come emerge from the uh, from the bark. Uh, this one is one that's going to grow best in northern climates, but you've learned from attending some of the Appalachian cl uh, classes that because due to the glaciers, not because we had glaciers, but we were able to uh, have this species at elevations higher than 5,500 here. Um, but this is a an excellent source for um, turpentine and varnishes. It's often going to be used in toiletries um, and potpourri and even used in cough drops. 
and it's going to have some of those gummy resins, which I said gums and resins are different, and they are, but there's a link in there that kind of tells you the difference for which one of those is going to be, for which one each one of those is going to be used for. Um, this is the sugar maple, and the sweetest of all syrups is going to come from the sugar maple. That's probably pretty self-explanatory, but uh, we've seen the sugar maples in all their splendor here in the last couple weeks. Another favorite is the silver birch. A lot of folks will plant this uh, in landscapes just because of the uniqueness of the bark. Um, but you can see the flower there, and then you see the birch tar shampoo and body soap. So um, it's also going to yield a really pretty yellow green dye. And the bark is waterproof. So in Russia, they actually utilize this to dress in and give durability to Russian leather. Um, here is the quince, Cydonia oblonga. Uh, we're starting to see uh, see these planted a little bit more. It, um, if you eat the fruit, it is really, really, uh, it'll make you pucker. It's pretty tart. So a lot of people will utilize the fruit to make a really pretty um, jelly or jam. It does yield a really pretty pink color. Um, we go back to those mucinologous properties, the phytochemical properties. So we were talking about cosmetics. Uh, quince is gonna be one of those that we find um, often in mascara. Again, for that th uh, thickening and lengthening, um, kind of helping keep everything bound together. Uh, this is probably one of the more common landscape trees that we see planted now in the, in the US. It's a very common tree street, the ginkgo. Um, it is actually kind of a living fossil. It is the uh, sole survivor of a primitive order of plants that lived about 200 million years ago. Uh, if you have the ginkgos, uh, you probably, well, I guess it depends on how you look at it. Um, there is a female ginkgo in front of the Washington County Extension Office, and um, of course it drops fruit every year, and Ooh, it's a stinky little tree. So I don't know if you've ever encountered one. For the most part, um, I, I've only seen male, but there is there is the female and they can yield a pretty stinky fruit. Um, but a lot of uh, supplements for the ginkgo on the supermarket shelf. Um, this is one that has always been considered uh, very tenacious. Again, it is a living fossil. fossil. But think back to Hiroshima, J Japan. Uh, there were six of these trees that were growing less than a mile from where the atomic bomb was dropped in 1945. And so, if you recall, there were very few living things that survived um, that explosion. Um, but the ginkgos, those six ginkgos that were there, they were charred and a little bit burned, but they survived and um, they're still alive today. So, a very tenacious plant. Uh, this is the sweet gum tree, and of course, multi, multiple uses there. Uh, a lot of folks will utilize these in crafts. It is really pretty for fall color. Uh, the bark is actually going to be utilized for incense and fumigation, uh, believe it or, or not. Uh, when you crush the, the leaves, they'll actually release a really nice um, fragrance. That's why we call this tree the sweet gum tree. Oftentimes, uh, this tree is going to be um, mixed with witch hazel or lavender or rose, and you'll see there that it's actually um, one of the ingredients in sea breeze. So it is used in some of the facial astring astringents. Um, think back to 9-11, when Flight 93 um, crashed in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Uh, the organizers from 9-11 actually planted this tree as a memorial um, in Shanksville. And then you can also, when this plant is injured, it's going to produce that little gummy resin again. So when it solidifies, then you can utilize that um, in barrel making. The resin is going to be utilized um, as a chewing gum, too. Uh, this is sassafras, another one. I don't have the picture up here, but beautiful fall foliage, very aromatic um, tree. But if you like um, Cajun food, this is the plant, the leaf that is ground up to make gumbo filet. Um, it's also what uh, gives flavor to root beer, toothpaste, and even uh, tobacco, and the fruit has been used in uh, perfumes before. 
Of course, the saffron, which is found in the sassafras plant, has been banned from being utilized in root beer um, in the U.S. today. Uh, the Native Americans love this tree. It was used as a tonic. Remember, we've talked a lot about those spring tonics, um, and this was one of those early trees. It was also touted as a good um, blood purifier. Uh, for those in Kentucky or in Middle Tennessee, if you just drive up the road a little ways to Owensboro, Kentucky, um, the world's uh, longest living sassafras tree is there at over 100 foot high. Uh, this is the European ash. It's going to have some distinct uh, color in the spring and in the fall uh, because you're going to get the flowers in the spring and then the fruit in, in the fall. It's going to be really uh, rich in vitamin C. So uh, if you're a wild forager, a lot of folks will utilize this in a, in a jam or a jelly. Uh, this is one that's going to contain um, the cyanide. The other cool thing about this, this um, what you see down here, this little cross, it was actually used um, as a country charm against witchcraft in Scotland. So the, the plant, this plant, the European ash was actually called um, the witch in England. And they would actually use these as dowsing rods uh, versus some of the, the witch hazel. And then in the springtime, uh, going back to some of those early um, season rituals as we're emerging from, from winter. So when farmers would go gather their cattle um, to drive them to, or to drive them to pasture for first time, um, they would utilize twigs from the mountain ash because they said that that would ensure their health and fertility throughout that season. Um, here's another pretty cool little plant. We see this one pretty frequently. This is the yew or Taxus baccata. It's very slow growing, but it lives for a very long time. Um, this is one you're not going to find in the wild very often, but many gardeners like it because it's kind of neat and tidy. Uh, if you've ever heard of Taxol, T-A-X-O-L, that is um, a substance that's being used in cancer treatments, cancer studies and research right now. Um, more specifically, uh, probably the Pacific U is being used for that. If you burn wet leaves from the U, um, it will create a smoldering. It doesn't really burn, but it um, helps ward off insects and it re repels gnats and mosquitoes. Uh, some of the pictures you see here was, um, these were found with a 5,000 year old um, ice man in the European Alps. So it's known to be really, um, a, well, a closed, poor softwood. So it's going to be very similar to cedar and pine, really easy to work. So, you, you know, you could bend it into different shapes that you needed it to be, but it had, you know, a lot of good elasticity. Um, again, anything like a bow it was used for. So this is going to be one of the oldest known artifacts. It's a Clacton spear, um, again, about 500 years old. The other cool thing about the yew is that the entire plant is um, poisonous except for the arrow, which is that red flesh of the berry covering the seed. And um, the rest of the plant poisonous, think back to those alkaloids that we talked about first off. Uh, this is the linden tree or basswood tree. Uh, this is one that's really hard to identify um, in the wild because it does hybridize so freely. Um, but one of the world's best honey um, actually comes from linden or the linden blossom. Um, dried flowers that you see here, they're going to be mildly sweet and sticky. Um, it's a, the fruit's going to be very mucinologous, so again, um, it's going to possess those qualities. Sometimes you'll hear this tree called lime flower or lime tree, uh, but some folks will actually make it into um, a tea. And they will actually um, use this tree to make fibers. Uh, very similar to how they utilize hemp. This is another plant that um, the flowers were added to tobacco and peace pops to give it that sweet aromatic um, smell. I threw cotton in here. Um, it's not just for blue jeans, but just for, as a reminder that um, plants do give us clothing, and then you can see there also cottonseed oil. Uh, we talked about uh, the marshmallow a few minutes ago, so the hibiscus, the okra, um, cotton, all of those are going to be in the same family. And just FYI, um, cotton is being researched as a male contraceptive 
as well. So there's some links in there if you want to read up on that. Uh, this is a plant we're not going to find here. It's not native to our areas, but a lot of folks are starting to use these in water gardens. So I thought it was worth mentioning here. Um, it pretty well grows on nothing. I mean, it'll grow in mud. It grows in a lot of water. It just um, will grow on rock. Um, but you can kind of see there it almost looks like a, a succulent. It, it is going to be considered a bitter. Some people will actually um, eat this. Um, many cultures are going to use this to treat epilepsy. Um, consider it great for anything to do, nour nourishing the, the brain. But a lot of folks, again, are using these in hydroponics or aquatics. And you can see there, um, you can also buy that as a supplement. Another plant we've spent quite a bit of time talking about in the last uh, several weeks is the black cohosh. Um, again, sometimes you'll hear this referred to as skunk plant because it does emit that odor, but it is a really beautiful woodland shade perennial. Uh, Native Americans would use this plant along with blue cohosh. They have, they look different, um, but and they have separate um, qualities, but they were both used in childbirth. Um, this was also going to be one that was used pretty frequently for uh, rattlesnake bite. Um, women, you can see there, menopause support, that's another um, issue that black cohosh is touted for. The Joe Pye weed, um, this is one that uh, if you brush up against it, you'll get a really nice vanilla or apple fragrance. Um, it was named after the Native American Joe Pye, who was um, said to have cured typhus for the New Englanders. Uh, this plant um, spreads by rhizomes. So if you've ever seen it clustering in, in the pastures and in the fields, that's how it does reproduce. But you can actually take that rhizome and it will help induce a, a fever breaking sweat. So Joe Pye does have um, a little bit of benefit to it besides just being uh, pretty. You probably can tell there too that it will yield a really pretty uh, pink dye. And again, uh, Native Americans were, were the first to really to discover that. Uh, this is another plant, though, that has its humble beginnings um, as, a, I guess, a pasture weed of sorts, but it is starting to be utilized in anti-cancer research as well. This is one that we're starting to see a little bit of an increase in. These are lupines, so we're starting to see folks utilize these as a cover crop. Um, they also serve the purpose as pollinator. But these, um, these uh, plants have been known to rejuvenate uh, the skin and rejuvenate the soil. Uh, you can actually roast the seeds and utilize those as a uh, coffee substitute as well. Um, these are going to be a nitrogen fixer, so they're going to utilize nitrogen and, and put that back into the soil. So that's a, one reason that people are starting to use them as a cover crop or as a green manure. Uh, one thing that they're again known for is rejuvenating the skin, rejuvenating the soil. So you see a picture there of Chernobyl. Uh, they have been known to absorb excess uh, poisons or toxins, chemicals in the soil. Uh, they were planted around Chernobyl and that was uh, what they said was helping to um, absorb the radiation after that nuclear disaster. Many of you are probably familiar with this plant too, if you're gardening, pyrethrum. Um, it is a natural organic in, insecticide and it's such a pretty little flower as well. So um, it's actually from the center of this plant, just an accumulation of this that goes into making uh, the pyrethrum. So just a few uh, oddities, I guess, to leave you with tonight. Uh, and next week we're going to talk about edibles and I promise I won't talk about lima beans and elderberries and a few of the plants we're going to talk about in the next few uh, slides. But these are probably plants that we can't grow here very well, probably got some occurrences that we do, but uh, not native to our region. Uh, but these are the cashews or what we call cashew apples. That's what the swollen stem is called. Um, this is actually how the nut is harvested. Um, all parts of this plant are going to be eaten in Asia, but we don't dare do that here. Um, but they do actually make spirits, a, a liquor out of this plant as, as well. The oil of this plant is known to be very caustic, um, but they also utilize it for dyes and other cultures as well. But um, the cashew hull is actually toxic. You don't want to be eating that. So this is the portion that we eat here. <laughs> 
Uh, this is a pretty cool plant. We're starting to see this more and more on supermarket shelves. This is the, the jackfruit, um, artocarpus. It is an evergreen shade tree. Uh, the cool thing about this plant, I don't know if you can see it, but the, the fruit actually grows from the trunk of the plant. And it's uh, said to mimic tofu of sorts because it will take on the flavor of whatever you're, you're cooking. Um, so it is going to be considered a, a meat substitute. There's a better picture. So you can see how big these jackfruit can actually get. Uh, this is actually um, a monk, and this robe that he has on is dyed completely from the jackfruit. So kind of cool little plant. This is carob, or um, our chocolate substitute with no caffeine, if you will. Uh, this is a, a drought resistant shrubby little tree. You can tell there that it is a legume just by looking at it. It's going to have a really sugar rich pulp. Show you the pictures. So this is actually what is harvested as that um, carob seed, but this little brown powder right here is actually used in bouillon cubes. Just FYI, that color uh, that you see in bouillon, that's where that's coming from is carob. Um, also, one carob seed equals one carrot. So when we think about diamonds, ladies, it was actually um, this plant um, that helped us determine the size of a carrot. Just some more notable herbs. Uh, some of you have heard me talk about these before. Um, poison hemlock, of course, that was what killed Socrates. Uh, Jimson weed, poke weed, we've mentioned a few of these, but there's some links to, to some of these. Asinite uh, for the monk's hood. Make sure you check those out. We talked a little bit about foxglove tonight uh, with, with digitalis, but some of these uh, can have some other uses that I didn't really go into tonight. Um, you probably recognize that a lot of these are utilized as a recreational type drug that can provide um, hallucinations and such. But they do have a very colorful and, and storied um, past. Um, I did put some reference in here to my, my favorite herbals. Um, a lot of the resource material that I used tonight, so you'll, you'll get a copy of that with the, with the links like you did there last week. So that is all I have for you tonight, but I, I hope uh, at least maybe it's uh, given you a little bit of an introduction to some of those phytochemical properties. Um, we often don't like to talk about those. They're big words. Even myself, you know, I'm just like, I can't even pronounce half of them. But it's just really cool to kind of synthesize all that down and really start investigating just how much plants really do, do give us. So next week, we're going to take it a step further and we're going to focus more on edibles. Um, things that we can be planting in our backyard, some things that take a little while, some things that uh, we're going to reap um, instant benefit from. So uh, make sure you tune in for that. So I will leave you all with that. Again, if there's any comments or questions, I'll get those synthesized and back out to you along with the link to the Google Drive. But I think most of you have access to that, to that now because I've, I've been seeing a lot of the familiar faces on here each week. So thanks for tuning in. And we will see you next week. Thanks, y'all.